Um, the three of us are all going to take on different things. We're, we're not going to be able to do everything as advertised. We, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So um, I'm going to focus on the point counts. Um, Doug's going to talk about uh, the marsh bird survey and how that relates to the atlas. And Mark's going to talk about uh, finding nests and about work in the remote north. We ended up concluding we had too much to cover. So we, we're not going to cover the owl surveys here. We have done that previously on the Sapi Hour and would encourage you if you um, want to uh, find out more about the owl surveys. Um, of course, all the information is on the website, but there's also videos on the, uh, the Atlas YouTube channel to, to get more details on those. So I'll jump right into the point counts because like I said, we have a lot of ground to cover here. So um, point counts in a nutshell. And Daryl, I don't know if you're out there, just say hello. I'm, I stole some pictures from Atlas too, and this is Daryl doing a point count back in Atlas II. So point counts are all about uh, getting information on the relative abundance of each of the species. So if you, if you have a copy of the Atlas, you, you know this, but the, um, this is what the book looks like. The map at the bottom left here is the uh, map based on breeding evidence. So different colored oranges and reds there are different weights of breeding evidence. And the black dots show whether the bird was there in, in uh, show birds that were there in Atlas One, but not in Atlas Two. So you can see that those the breeding evidence maps give us the overall picture of where the bird breeds during the um, uh, during the Atlas period, and um, it allows us to look at how that's changed over time, and shows us the overall pattern of occurrence and strength of breeding. Now the map at the top right here. This is the relative abundance map. This is what comes from the point counts and, and this is what we're talking about today. So Atlas II, we had tremendous success with. Uh, we were the first atlas in uh, North America to introduce this idea of doing point counts to count relative abundance for atlases. And now it's done on just about every atlas that comes along. Atlases got into it big time. We were just shocked at the uh, extent of pickup with Atlas II. And we're hoping we can continue with that in, in Atlas III. 68,000 point counts, which was far more than we ever dreamed we would get across the continent. And it's uh, to me, this is going to be one of the highlights of the project, to be able to compare back 20 years ago and look at how these patterns of relative abundance have changed over time between the, between the two projects. Um, I, I, of course, that's going to give us insight into the patterns of change, and that's going to help us get some idea about what kind of things might be driving these uh, these patterns that we're seeing and, and that researchers are going to be able to um, delve deeper into, into that, uh, that point count data. Okay, so I, I showed this slide earlier, but um, different examples of what some of the different species distributions look like. Um, the, I've used these four letter codes here for the different species. These are really handy. If you haven't uh, learned the four letter codes yet, would really recommend doing it. You'll see why as I go through, but so the northern rough wing swallow down at the bottom left there, a bird pretty much restricted to the southern part of the province, very concentrated though. The, the, um, the breeding evidence data didn't show the extent to which the bird is concentrated right around the shores of Lake Erie and uh, the very southwest part of the province. Um, the, the, the one that most interests me here uh, um, is the Wilson snipe. You'll see how it's, uh, widely distributed across southern Ontario, absent from the, the southwest portion, but um, high numbers in that area south of the shield in eastern Ontario. But when you get up in the Hudson Bay lowlands, you can see huge numbers of birds up in there. And the point count data reveals this where the other sources of information um, just, just aren't able to give us that same, that same depth of knowledge. So point counts, these are the primary methods of learning about relative abundance of all land birds. When you hear that uh, 3 billion birds have, di have disappeared from North America, that's largely based on breeding bird survey data, which is point counts. And so um, there's a, a, a rich history of doing, po uh, doing point counts across the continent. Um, it, it's a very, very simple survey it involves standing at one spot in the atlas. Uh, most of those points are predetermined. You stand for a set amount of time, in our case, five minutes and you count all the birds that you hear and see during that five minute period. Um, they're done during the peak of the breeding season, and I'll, I'll touch on when that is, but basically it's late May through early July, and they're done in the early morning when birds are most active singing. 
Um, they do give us this ability to look at how populations changed over time, the, um, how the, uh, as you saw on those maps, how the um, numbers vary across the landscape. And they do give us this ability to look at actual population sizes for a lot of species. And so that's gonna be one of the um, real advantages to this point count data. So there are two types for the atlas. Um, one is a just traditional point count, pretty much as I described on that last slide. Then the new one is a digital point count. Now, we're introducing this again to North America. We're out there in front of everybody else. Nobody is having volunteers collect data by point counts uh, on anything like the scale that we're attempting here for, for Atlas Three. So I'm hoping for uh, widespread cooperation on this one as well. Um, the nice thing about digital point counts is you don't necessarily have to know your birds well. You just use a handheld digital recorder at each point instead of actually having to identify birds yourself. Um, we can do this because the great majority of birds on point counts are detected by sound. Um, the, the another nice thing about this, of course, is we have a recording that's now it's permanent. We can look at that. So people can look at that 100 years from now and, um, and dig out things. They can also have it. Uh, they can also we're learning more and more about how to extract um, data from these recordings. Um, automatically, and they're going to be able to do more of that kind of thing over time and look at patterns uh, of the bird song that, that we can't even imagine looking at at this point. Um, we are working with the uh, University of Alberta um, on something called wild tracks and over the next few weeks we'll be sort of rolling out information about this uh, and how we're going to manage and interpret these uh, these recordings. So the, the, the point count set up in southern Ontario. Um, is uh, as shown on the map here. There are 40 numbered locations on there. There's actually a mix of, of stations on here. We took 15 um, stations that had been done in Atlas 2 and we're repeating those. We've changed the numbering system, but um, we've got 15 repeat points from Atlas 2. And we've got some new ones to try and compensate for the fact that the landscapes changed quite a bit. I'm um, thinking about um, suburban development and that kind of thing that has roads in it that we want to we want to be able to uh, 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 follow using the point count data. So at each one of those points, you go out and you do your five minute point count. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to some other stuff about the map, but um, various ways of recording information for point counts. Um, one of them is on the app. And this is what the app looks like. So in, instead of just uh, like in Atlas 2, we just recorded the whole five minutes. How many birds did you report in that five minute period? This time we've introduced two time bands. So how many birds do you get in that first three minutes? And then you just add on any additional birds that you get in the second. And this is useful for us. Um, it helps us look at the likelihood that we're detecting all of the birds that are occurring in that area. And um, by using the three minutes, we can tie in to the breeding bird survey that I mentioned before and use the breeding bird survey data um, in the atlas because the breeding bird survey already uses three minute point counts. And so you can see for each bird, you're just recording a number um, of uh, birds for uh, uh, in each of those two time bands. I should mention, we're also asking that you record um, the higher level of breeding evidence. So if you do find birds carrying food or you get a distraction display or something like that, or you see fledged young, you can actually tap on the species name and it will pop up with the breeding evidence um, uh, box and you can actually add that fact. I, I'd recommend you do that after the five minutes is up, but um, we are encouraging to uh, collect information that way as well on breeding evidence. So you can, of course, do this on a notebook. You don't have to use an app. Frankly, personally, I'm going to use my notebook to collect data because um, it, it's just, it, I'm, I'm not the fastest with my thumbs, um, but I'm pretty fast with a pencil. So this is where the four letter codes come in, come in very handy as on the app. It's, it's much quicker if you can. You have a good solid system of using four letter codes and would encourage you to do that. Um, like on this example, um, you can also record breeding, the higher levels of breeding evidence that you, that you get uh, while, uh, while doing the point count. Now, we are often offering other possibilities. If you are comfortable estimating the distance from yourself to birds, you can um, uh, take the sort of more advanced route here and 
uh, put birds into distance bands as well as those time bands. So you just the distance bands are less than 50 meters, 50 to 100 or greater than 100. You just classify each bird that you see as to which of those three bands it's in. Uh, record the number of birds of each. Uh, record breeding evidence if it's a higher level. And um, you've got all that information there. So then you can then go and um, input that data to the um, Atlas website. And of course, you can do the same thing uh, in a tabular form uh, like this. Again, I'll probably use this tabular form. I, I, I find this the, the most straightforward way of doing it. Um, it, it just because it, to some extent, the, the data is already tabulated. I don't have to figure out from that circle um, how many of each species I got and that kind of thing. It's already, already there for data entry. So those four letter codes, they are gonna be on the website and um, you, can, uh, you can use those. I would encourage you to use them. It's, it really streamlines things for you. Just to quickly mention the, the, uh, the, the way it works. If you have a species that just has one name like an Anhinga or what else do we have? Like a Sora, um, you just use the first four letters of the name. So in this case, A and H I for Anhinga. If it's a two word name, you just use the first two letters of each of the two words. If it's a three word name, you use the first, the first, and the first two. And then if it's a four letter name, you use the first letter of each of the four words. And so come up with those four letter codes and um, streamline your data entry. Um, so back to this, in addition to doing um, the the 20 roadside points that you're asked to do in each square. And if you look at the large circle there, it indicates a number of off-road points. And we are, and we have sort of calculated for each square how well the roadside layer represents the square. And so in this case, we need more, um, four more points in, in broadleaf forest. So off-road points in, for, uh, in broadleaf forest in order to make up for the shortage on the roadside of, of that habitat. And the same with mixed forest. So each square has its own specifications and you are to find your way to patches of habitat. Try and get out into the middle of the patch of habitat. Uh, make sure as much as you can that it's 100 meters of that habitat all around you in a circle and um, and start your point count. Um, I also no, uh, note here the A and the B are um, Atlas point counts that were done in off-road situations in Atlas 2. And so again, you can see the obvious advantage. If we can repeat those same points, it gives us a very direct comparison to the past Atlas. So um, we've made up to 10 points available um, if off-road points were done in each of those, in each of those, uh, well, in each square that they were done. Um, the square summary sheet has information on it as well as the map as to how many of those uh, uh, off-road point counts you're requested to do in each square. Now the recorded point counts then, we've purchased these Zoom H2N units, made those available to regional coordinators. Each regional coordinator has one or two of these. Uh, we'll hopefully get more in future years, but um, they can be loaned out to atlasers for the collection of data. Um, you don't need to be an expert to do this. Um, you can get them, you get, the, get these from your regional coordinator. When you've done the recording, you download the information. Um, or if you're not comfortable with, with the sort of downloading process, you can just return the unit to the regional coordinator and they'll, and they'll do the downloading. Um, we are going to be developing wild tracks, as I mentioned, and we are going to be developing this idea of uh, crowdsourcing. So if you're an expert birder, you can identify birds well by song, you can go onto the website, pull off a point count, listen to it, interpret it, and uh, that way we get, uh, we get the data. And we'll be certainly encouraging people to be doing that over the course of the project. So if you are using a, a Zoom unit at a point, um, you just basically go out, you set up the Zoom, make sure that the settings are correct. Uh, you write down in, the, in your notebook, the date, the time, the square number, and the point number, and then you start the recording. And then you read out loud the date, the time, the square, and the point number. Um, and so that's on the recording as a, as a permanent record. And then you start the timer and you start your recording. It runs for five minutes. You get a beep to tell you your five minutes is up or actually you'll need a three minute and a, and a final two minute beep. And then you just press stop and you go into the next 
next stop. Now I should say we have got um, manuals in the works that uh, they're, they're now translated, but they should be on the website in the next, uh, next couple of weeks to give you all the details on how this works. Uh, our goals are to cover, basically we wanna get these done in every square in Southern Ontario, um, in the dark green area there, um, either, uh, either on row, uh, sorry, either um, traditional point counts or digital point counts, about 5% in the middle part of the province there where there's reasonable road access, and then 2% of squares in the, in the far north. Um, you can download the point count locations from the website. This is sort of a split screen. So the top half of the screen is just, you can, you can go to the square resources tab, press on that. It will open up these maps. Um, you pick out the square, and then you can see on the right there, your ability to download the map in a, the point count locations in a format that works best for you. And there are uh, videos on the website or on uh, the Atlas um, YouTube channel that um, describe in more detail how you can do that. Okay, so sorry to uh, skip that through skip through that so quickly, but got to hand things off to Doug to talk about Marsh Bird Survey. I'm I'm just going to um, change the slide, so just let me know whenever you need me to change, Doug. Sounds good. <clears throat> okay, hi everyone. Okay, so what I'd like to do over the next 15 minutes is, hopefully in 15, is give an overview of the Atlas Three Marsh Bird Survey. Next slide, please, Mike. So this is one of the three special surveys for Atlas III, uh, the others being owls and night jars, of course, like you see here. And I'd like to point out right off the top that there are, at least in my mind, many conceptual similarities between the protocols for these three special surveys. So if you're finding the many details you know, a bit overwhelming because they are a bit detailed, you'll be happy to know that there are at least some, there's at least some overlap at a high level in how the three are set up. Next slide, please. So first things first, you know, why do we even need a special marsh bird survey? We already have the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program uh, delivered by Birds Canada, and a few marsh birds are picked up on regular roadside atlas point, point counts. So, you know, can't we just use data from these other program programs to get what we need? Next slide, please. Well, Perhaps unsurprisingly, the answer of course is no, we can't just use data from these other data sets. Um, the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program has good coverage in Southern Ontario, south of the Shield, as you see here in the map, but coverage is too sparse in Central Ontario, and it's pretty well non-existent in Northern Ontario to get what we really want out of this. And we tried mapping marsh birds using regular uh, roadside point count data from Atlas 2, and there's just too few detections for it to work well. Next slide, please. So we've designed the Marsh Bird Survey to fill these knowledge and data gaps. And we anticipate at least two main science products from the effort. So one, the first ever abundance maps for marsh bird species like American Coot, Common Gallinule, Least Bittern, Pied-Billed Grebe, Sora, and Virginia Rail. And two, the first ever um, robust total population size estimates for all of those species I just listed for the entire province. And both of these products will be extremely useful in multiple different ways for conservation planning. Next slide, please. So what's involved? So in terms of skill level, uh, participants must be able to identify all local birds by sight and by song uh, and call. And being able to identify common wetland plants is helpful as there is a simple but quick habitat assessment uh, to be done at each survey location. But as we shall see, good plant ID is definitely not required. Next slide, please. So the marsh bird survey occurs throughout the entire province, but to ensure a representative sample of squares, we've randomly identified priority marsh bird survey squares, which is what you see here. Um, these have been stratified in various ways as indicated by the different colors and by anticipated atlaser capacity with fewer squares selected per unit area north of tomogamy and more south of tomogamy. Although atlasers are encouraged, if they wish, uh, to complete the marsh bird survey in any square, even if it isn't a priority square. But obviously the priority squares are the focus. Next slide, please. The timing is 
24th of May to 10th of July, south of Tomogamy, and 1st of June to 10th of July, north of Tomogamy. And these are the same date windows as the regular roadside atlas point counts. Um, surveys can be done in the morning or in the evening, a little bit different than uh, some of the other uh, point, count, uh, point counts for the atlas. So this means 30 minutes before sunrise until five hours after sunrise, or four hours before sunset until 30 minutes after sunset. And these are the same timing windows as regular roadside atlas point counts for morning, and they're the same as the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program for evening. And evening surveys are allowed, of course, because the detection probabilities of the targeted species like bitterns and rails are very similar in the morning or the evening uh, as a result of the, uh, the broadcast, the playback that we'll talk a bit about later. So allowing evening surveys uh, makes things much more flexible for atlasers to get everything done. Next slide, please. So like owl and nightjar surveys, um, there are restrictions on acceptable weather in terms of wind and precipitation. Uh, and like owl surveys, uh, like I mentioned before, there's a standardized broadcast of targeted bittern and rail species, which is played using an amplified speaker during each survey, which will, of course, tremendously boost the detections um, of these species to a level that will generate the data that we're really after. Next slide, please. So the overall concept of how things work within a square is similar to owls and night jars. So at the most basic, um, you use the regular roadside atlas point count stations to locate one to eight randomly chosen marsh bird survey point count stations. And then you perform at least one 10 minute point count at each station. An optional second point count at each station, at least 10 days later, but in the same year is highly encouraged, but it's not required. So the second visit allows us to adjust in, in various ways for differences in detection probabilities. And, but we don't need this to be done at all stations. It's fine if you can only do one survey visit for whatever reason, and that'll happen in a lot of cases, especially say in squares in Northern Ontario where you might only be visiting on one day or whatever. But it's gold, so to speak, um, if you can do the two visits. Next slide, please. Okay, so how does one determine where the actual point count stations are within a square. Well, here's probably the most unique and uh, challenging aspect of the whole process. Um, we weren't able to randomly pre-select the stations ahead of time, as is the case for owls and night jars, which of course are done at the regular roadside point count stations. Um, we weren't able to do this because existing geospatial GIS layers for identifying marsh bird habitat is, somewhat surprisingly, uh, not good enough at a fine enough scale uh, across most of the province. Next slide, please. So instead, you will randomly identify marsh bird survey stations within a square in two steps, like you see here. First, you'll randomly identify marsh bird habitat patches, which are shown here in blue. And second, you'll identify marsh bird survey stations within or at the edge of marsh bird habitat patches, which are shown here as black dots. Next slide, please. There's a detailed definition of what constitutes a marsh bird habitat patch in the protocol manual. But briefly here, a marsh bird habitat patch is a marsh, an open grown bog, fen, or shrub wetland, or a mix of these wetland types that's at least one hectare in size. A marsh bird habitat patch is not a shallow unvegetated lake nor is it a swamp with dense, relatively tall trees that form mostly a closed canopy overhead. And of course, this definition is meant to capture all of the potential types of wetlands throughout the province that we expect the targeted marsh bird species like bitterns and rails to occur in. Next slide, please. So how does all this shake out when applied to an actual square? Um, you might have skipped ahead one slide there. You might have to go back one. There we go. Perfect. Um, so you start with designated roadside survey station number one, which in this case is up at the top center. Then you select the closest accessible marsh bird habitat patch that meets the criteria. 
and you keep going, if you can, up to designated roadside survey station number eight. Now in this square, it was only possible to place five stations, and that's fine. In many squares, there won't, uh, there won't be, or we won't be able to get access to eight stations, and that's okay. Even one station in a square is really useful data. Next slide, please. So depending on road access and the arrangement of wetlands in any particular square, the placement of stations can take many different forms like you see here in some examples that are given in the protocol manual. Um, whether you follow the instructions exactly to identify marshbird habitat patches and the stations within them are not necessarily all that important. The most important thing is that you randomly pre-select marshbird habitat patches and not just go to your favorite spots. Next slide, please. So you'll have to use a combination of information from the Atlas square map, uh, online aerial satellite imagery and field observations to locate and confirm that marshbird habitat patches meet the criteria. Next slide, please. The protocol manual covers uh, various scenarios that will crop up, such as what do you do if there are no marsh bird habitat patches? That will happen, especially in some parts of southwestern Ontario where we've lost a lot of wetlands. Or there are no accessible marsh bird habitat patches. There may be marshes, but they're all on private land and you can't get to them. Um, so that there's, that's covered in the manual as to what to do in those situations. And what do you do in a square that has no roads and therefore has no designated roadside point count stations? We cover that as well. Next slide, please. So once you've identified a marsh bird habitat patch, then you'll find a good accessible vantage point at the edge of or within each patch that is approximately closest to the designated survey station that was used to identify the patch. And this point is a marsh bird survey station. And this is the location from which you will conduct the surveys. You'll need to record the coordinates uh, of each station using a GPS unit or alternatively your phone so they can be recorded in the database. Next slide, please. It's possible that one large marsh bird habitat patch is closest to one or more of the designated roadside points. So in this case, you can place more than one station at the edge of or within that large patch, as long as each station is greater than 400 meters apart. If the patch is all filled up, then proceed to the next nearest patch to the designated roadside point and so on. Next slide, please. So most marsh bird survey stations will be at the edge of a quiet back road, but if they do fall on busy roads, which will happen with loud traffic, we encourage you to place them if possible, a reasonable distance away from the road for better listening during surveys. And if a marsh bird habitat patch is really big, in other words, it's greater than about 300 meters across at its widest point, then we encourage you to place stations at least 100 meters out into the interior of the patch and access them with a canoe or a boat if possible, but it's certainly not required. Um, this is because, of course, many of the targeted marsh bird species occur at much greater abundance towards the middle of really large wetlands. Next slide, please. So please keep the following criteria in mind when placing marsh bird survey stations so that other atlasers, perhaps yourself, um, will more easily be able to visit the stations in the future. So make sure they're physically accessible at the time of year of the survey, um, obviously legally accessible, no trespassing, uh, near a safe parking spot in a quiet location with little traffic, not directly in front of a house. Uh, points should be at the very edge of or within the marsh bird habitat patch and more than 400 meters from any marsh bird survey, any other marsh bird survey station. Next slide, please. Okay, so you've randomly identified marsh bird habitat patches and you've placed the survey stations at the edge of or within the patches. So what happens during actual surveys at these stations? Well, it's very much like a regular roadside point count or point counts for either owls or night jars. You stand quietly or sit quietly in your boat and count all birds seen or heard during a 10 minute period. Uh, you start the broadcast on your amplified playback equipment at the very start of the 10 minute count and the broadcast keeps track of the time for you. There's beeps at the beginning and beeps at the very end. Next slide, please. 
So you'll record on a map five pieces of information for each individual or group of individuals of each species that you see or hear during um, each survey. So those five pieces of information are obviously the species using the four letter codes that Mike was talking about. Um, second, you'll record the time interval of the first detection of three possible time intervals. Uh, the first three minutes, the next two minutes, and the final five minutes. So the three time slices are set up that way. Um, you'll also record the distance of first detection of three possible distance categories or bands, the same ones that Mike was talking about, zero to 50 meters, 50 to 100, and greater than 100 meters. The fourth piece of information is the direction of the first detection. Simply, is it in front of you or behind you? And five, the breeding evidence, uh, if applicable. And again, we're only asking for uh, probable and confirmed. So this approach is nearly identical to the most sophisticated uh, regular roadside point count protocol. Uh, recording these many different pieces of information, of course, will allow us to make more robust population size estimates because we can use those different time slices and the different distance bands either on their own or in combination to do a bunch of really crazy fancy math that really lets us get a good estimate of the actual density, the actual total number of birds at those points. And then we can extrapolate up across the whole province. And of course, it also recording all these uh, extra pieces of information allow us to combine the data with other data sets uh, like the breeding bird survey that's only three minutes long, like Mike was saying. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so at the time of your first marsh bird survey, uh, you will perform a simple marsh bird habitat assessment. So at each marsh bird survey station, you'll record four pieces of marsh bird habitat information. So one, the wetland type, there's basically three to choose from. Um, two, the presence of certain influential factors, like is, there, is it a beaver pond? Is there a beaver dam influencing the survey area? Uh, three, the percent aerial coverage of major vegetation and land cover types. Um, basically, we're just asking you to look around you within 100 meters from the survey station and estimate things like, is it 50% of that area that's covered with open water? Is 50% of it, for example, covered in emergent vegetation and so on. And the last piece of information is the percent aerial coverage of emergent non-woody plants. Because marsh birds really uh, are influenced quite a bit by different types of emergent vegetation, especially, we ask you to zero in on the emergent vegetation and um, tell us, is half of it cattail? Is half of it grass sedge? Is half of it phragmites? Or whatever the percentage might be. This sounds much more complicated than it really is. It's obviously a big learning curve if you haven't done these kind of things before, but once you've done a few of them, it becomes very easy. But if folks are turned off by it and you don't wish to complete the habitat survey, we understand, we get it. Uh, then as we describe in the protocol manual, you can take a picture of the station, uh, even with your phone would be fine and send it to us and we can complete the assessment using the picture and online imagery, we can do it for you. This doesn't work quite as well, but it can be done and it still gets us very useful information. Next slide, please. Okay, so there you have it. I'd like to end by stressing that safety should be top priority while doing these surveys as with any atlasing activity. Um, the marsh bird survey may find you in fairly isolated areas and might involve over water work uh, if you're doing uh, stuff in boats. So we provide a long description of tips of how to work safely during these surveys in the protocol manual. And, and of course we require everyone to read, understand and follow those pretty please. So thank you and I hope you find these surveys fun and rewarding and hopefully not too complicated. There's a big learning curve, but I think once you're, you've done a few of them, it'll be really fun and easy. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, I think we'll jump right into Mark. Are you able to? Yep. Okay, so I think if I just keep going. Good to go, great. Oh. Uh, welcome everyone. This is so exciting. And if it does seem a little overwhelming right now, don't worry, we're just getting going. You've got five years to figure this all out. If you're new to the Atlas, I promise you, you're gonna love it. 
if if you've done this before we're going to get even better information this time so it really is an exciting opportunity uh, i'm here to talk about a couple of things i get to wear two hats today the first one is about nest finding and doing some work with the nest so i don't know if you've gone on to the website before but if you have if you click on data entry, next mic, you'll immediately come to the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas page. And then if you go on to submit, you will see three choices. You'll see submit data, enter nest records or special surveys. Submit data is for the Atlas, obviously. Special surveys are for the marsh and the owl surveys and night jar surveys that, we, um, that Doug just talked about. And then you've got enter nest records. And if you click on enter nest records, you actually come to Project Nest Watch, which is another project that uh, Birds Canada has been doing through Nature Counts. And in a way, it's a really valuable tool for the Atlas. And it's not something that we're going to heavily promote, but it's something that I hope you'll really get involved with. Can you go to the next, please, Mike? All right, before I get started, if you are interested in searching for nests, or if you do accidentally come across the nest, we've got some concerns and some considerations that you should all pay attention to. So don't forget that this is a critical time for breeding birds. So we have to be mindful and protect them as much as possible. That doesn't mean we can't survey and actually survey nests and record information on nests. But when you are searching for them, be extra careful of your, mo your movements. A lot of them are ground nesting birds. You can easily step on a nest without realizing it. If you're monitoring nests, much of the monitoring of those nests can be done from a distance once you find it the first time. And if you are uncertain, back away and see if you can figure another way to do it. Ideally, if you could visit that nest two or three times during early stages of incubation and then you know, to see if the young fledge or not, that, that would provide great data. Next, Mike, please. And, and I, while I'm at it, I want to make a little plug for a Canadian Lakes Loon Survey, which Doug and Kathy Jones helped coordinate. It's the same sort of idea. We can get additional information on top of what the Atlas provides. We can find out exactly when birds are starting to breed or when they're starting to nest which can tell us a lot about climate change down the road and is a nice comparison from the previous atlas. And we can also learn a lot about productivity. Can you go to the next one, Mike? So for instance, if we can record the fact that we found a nest of a common loon and one month later, we see two young on the bird's back, we now know that that was a successful nest. And that's something that the atlas doesn't provide necessarily. So. I really want to promote if you do accidentally come across a nest or you are searching for them, enter that information into Project Nest Watch, which is available through the Atlas. All right, next, Mike. I also want to give a few, a few tips on how to look for nests if you're interested. The first thing to do, and a lot of us who are birding in migration hotspots like Pelee or Rondo really don't get to see the birds in their natural breeding environment. Keep in mind, a lot of birds are ground nesters or low nesting in bushes. So if you are interested in looking for a specific species or a nest of a specific species, do a little research ahead of time, find out where that species nests. There's no point looking for a hermit thrush four feet up in a tree when they're a ground nesting bird. And, and some of them are very difficult to find. Some of them you're gonna have to rely on you know, looking down at your feet and all of a sudden a bird pops out three feet in front of you. That sort of means or probably means that it just flushed off a nest. So that's why you need extra care. There's a lot of um, resources to help you. You can look at the first two atlases. You can look at the Breeding Birds of Ontario by Peck and James. They actually give a lot of detailed information on where nests are how high they are and, and what trees are even located in. And there's a new Peterson Field Guide to North American Bird Nests coming out in August of 2021, which will provide even you know glossy photos and, and even additional information. So keep those all in mind. Next, please, Mike. 
Okay, a couple of tricks to help you with nest finding. If you if the leaves haven't come out on the trees yet, look for some of the old nests or last year's nests. These will give you a good clue to where to look the following year. So if I've got a red-eyed vireo nest out in front of my house, chances are I'm going to have a red-eyed vireo pair coming back to this same general location, and I should probably search there. Or if I have a, a Baltimore Oriole nesting at a local park, they're probably going to nest the following year within 100 meters of that, that last nest site. So it's a great way to sort of say, okay, I'll come back here and check the following year. Next, please, Mike. Also keep in mind all of these safe dates that Mike uh, Burrell has been talking about. And, and they can come in handy for helping you find nests. Certain species nest at certain times. So right now, woodpeckers and a lot of the cavity nesting species like brown creeper and winter wren will be nesting shortly. Normal songbirds or songbirds that usually build an unenclosed nest in the mixed wood plains and the Carolinian areas will be probably starting in late May. So if you can time some of your trips out into your, your square or squares you're interested in, in late May and early June, and then look for evidence, you're more likely to find it. Birds will breed throughout the summer, but there is a really push and a concentration during that sort of last week of May and, and early June. And all you have to do is look for evidence by looking at the bird's bill mostly, right? If you see a bird with, with material in its bill, whether it's a fine hair or grass, chances are they're nest building. If you spend a little time, sit quietly and watch, you'll probably find where that bird is going to his nest. Keep in mind, nest building time is fairly sensitive. So try not to disturb the birds at that point. The other thing to keep in mind is two or three weeks later, usually 12 to sort of 17 days later, eggs hatch and young are in the nest and parents start feeding. So if you see birds with, with mouths full of food, same thing, sit quietly and just observe and watch. Next please, Mike. We have to get away from thinking about the gaudy males all the time. The real action, especially for breeding birds, are the females. So whenever you get to see a female, spend the extra time watching and observing her behavior. They're the ones who are gonna be going to the nest most of the time. Any information you can get this way will actually help you find and locate the nest. Next please, Mike. Now, what do you do if you see a nest? It's great to record the information into Project Nest Watch, but say you're kind of curious and you're not sure at what stage they're at. There's actually really easy ways to do it. So with this red start, this is 15 feet up in a tree. <clears throat> I know she's been, you know, she's sitting on the nest. So I am kind of curious, are there eggs? Are there young? Is she just getting started? So there's a really easy way. Uh, next, please, Mike. One of the things I like to carry with me, I know this may sound a little strange, is, is a bike mirror. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be this big. You don't need to fill up your, uh, your knapsack with, with a huge bike mirror. And I often carry a pole with me. The nice thing about this is when I do find a nest, I can just attach the mirror to the pole. Or if I have a stick and a little bit of tape with me, I can tie the mirror to the, the stick. And I can just take a quick peek in I'm not causing a lot of disturbance. I can be in and out in about 30 seconds and I can find out that that American Red Star had three eggs in a nest. And then I don't have to bother it again. I can come back a week later, see if it's feeding. If it's not, I can wait another week and then see how things are going along. All right, next please, Mike. You can even do this now and, and I'm not suggesting everybody does this, but if you suspect there's a bird nesting in a hole and you can't confirm it, because oftentimes birds will not, you could tap on a tree and a bird will not come out. You can actually stick your camera in, in a hole the size of a flicker, take a quick picture <coughs> and confirm whether there's a nest in there or not. It's exactly what I did with this kestrel. 
Um, the bird wasn't go coming out. I just sort of stuck the camera in, realized all of a sudden I've got a female kestrel in the nest. So next, please, Mike. All right, I'm going to switch hats now here. Now, for all of us who live in Carolina and Ontario, when I talk about going north to Atlas, I'm not talking about Muskoka. I'm not talking about Manitoulin Island, or I'm not talking about Ottawa. I'm talking about beyond Kenora, beyond Kapiskazing. Next, Mike, please. I'm talking about Ontario actually has ocean and it's got ocean coastline. There's this magnificent thing called the Hudson Bay Lowlands and the upper boreal forest, which is magical places to see. And if you've ever wanted to go up and, and visit these areas, the Atlas is this great opportunity. However, I do want to point out, and I do want to stress that it's not going to happen this year um, due to COVID. The other thing is, if you are thinking about traveling from Southern Ontario into Northern Ontario, check out the website. Check out, oh, sorry, someone clogged me up here. Um, check out the website for the COVID guidelines under the Get Involved section of, of Tools and Resources and make sure you're doing it safely. The last thing we wanna do is have Atlasers bringing COVID further north. Next, please, Mike. All right, so if you're gonna go Northern Atlasing, what normally happens is you start with about an eight or nine hour drive up to the Sioux or up to Timmins or Cochrane. And then in many cases, you'll get on some kind of plane. It could be a float plane or a beaver or a, a twin otter um, and they'll take you to a location and we'll talk about the locations in a second so part of the fun is just getting there but be aware it takes a couple of days in most cases to even start your northern atlasing trip next please mike um, a lot of the northern atlas trips are canoe trips uh, i had the pleasure last Atlas of going with Glenn Cody and Carl Conzi and Jerry Binsfeld and we had our wonderful guide Nick Mack from uh, Pewanek who took our canoe with us upstream and then all we had to do was actually float downstream with the current and and visit sites along the way so it was this wonderful opportunity we got to be with some of the indigenous communities and learn a little bit more of what life is like in the far north Next, please, Mike. Um, we also, some of you, if you're really lucky, will get to do some helicopter work. Uh, we did some work. I was with uh, Glenn and, and Don Sutherland, who's obviously very suspicious of me, probably still is. And it was just this wonderful opportunity to get up and see areas that I don't know how else I was going to see otherwise. Next, please, Mike. The North is really incredibly beautiful. Whether you're in the plain or on the ground, it's really exciting to see. Next, Mike, please. However, keep in mind, as beautiful as it is, there are no roads, there are no trails, you're breaking trail yourself. So if you're one of those people who doesn't like to stay on a trail, maybe Northern Atlasing is for you because you can go wherever you want. Next, please, Mike. Also keep in mind that accommodations are probably not what you're used to, and the weather can be very unpredictable. This is a, a snowstorm that we woke up to in early June. So Northern Atlasing, Atlasing is not for everyone. Next, please, Mike. You will also probably at some point go over your boots and you'll have to have your dinner underneath some socks that are drying and some very dirty socks that are drying in your tent at some point. Next, please, Mike. You'll also get to spend a lot of time sharing a blood meal with mosquitoes. Unfortunately, it's gonna be your blood. The mosquitoes and the black flies can be pretty intense up north. So if you don't like bugs, this may not be where you wanna go. And the other thing, next, please, Mike. It's a great opportunity to see mammals that you may not see. So not only do you get the chance to see black bears, you might see caribou or moose. 
and you might be very close to them. So it's something they get excited about one way or the other. Next, please, Mike. But I can honestly say a shoreline dinner or a shoreline lunch of freshly caught fish, you know, fried in a half a pound of shortening or lard, add it with a bit of salt. It may not be the healthiest, but it is one of the most fantastic meals you'll ever have the pleasure of having. Next, please, Mike. In addition, the birds are incredible. You've got an opportunity, if you're lucky, to see willow ptarmigan sitting on nests. They're sharp-tailed grouse um, nesting in those areas. Next. Or you could be walking, trudging through a mus muskeg, thinking, this is crazy, and all of a sudden come upon a sandhill crane chick that's just freshly out of the egg. Next, please, Mike. Or if you're really lucky, you'll get to see pine grosbeaks. beaks. This is a, a photograph of the first nest of Ontario from the last atlas that was ever documented. So there's always surprises around every corner. Next, please, Mike. As you can see on this map, there are a lot of trips that they're gonna try and repeat. As I said, we're not gonna be able to do it this year, but there are four remaining years. And there's an opportunity to go across different parts of, of the province and in different ways. So there's going to be lake to lodge trips, lowland river trips, MNRF and helicopters, remote community hiking, and road and boat access. So there's different opportunities depending upon your interest. And if you are interested, what you can do, well, we'll get to that in a second. Next, please, Mike. There's also new maps being generated to show exactly where you want and where you're expected to take point counts. As you probably remember, the atlas in the north is, is um, divided into 100 kilometer squares. So you've got different 10 kilometer squares that you're responsible for taking point counts in. And that's something to be excited about. So you'll get to travel in a two and a half week trip from sort of central northern Ontario all the way to the coast. It's, it's just a, a wonderful opportunity. Next, Mike, please. A couple of things to keep in mind. You've got to plan for a two to three week trip. That doesn't necessarily include travel time to get to those places or get back home. So three weeks is what you want to think about. As I mentioned, it's not available in 2021. If you are interested, contact the Atlas uh, head office Although I would suggest organize a team that works well together. You need to be healthy, physically capable. I strongly su suggest getting a, someone who likes to fish and someone who likes to cook. Um, I'd also suggest go to the dentist. I've been on four Northern trips where we've had teeth inf tooth infections. And so believe it or not, it, it happens. Everyone who should goes up, everyone who is gonna go up should be both at general, good at general atlasing point counts, and be willing to do any additional surveys you can, like nest finding or odinate surveys or download iNaturalist Canada and get onto those as well. Bring a GPS, bring a camera. You might want to get an acquisition license or possession an acquisition license for a firearm in case you do have bear issues. You might also want to get, and I strongly recommend, wilderness first aid training because Help is a long way off, as many as, you know, it could be a day or two before you get help. And I can't overestimate the importance of good equipment. You need a good tent. A four season tent is advisable. You need comfortable, warm sleeping bags and good boots because you're gonna be walking up to 10 to 20 kilometers a day in these in muskeg. And so that is not an easy thing for boots to handle. You also want to be prepared for all weather, obviously bugs as well. And there will be a manual coming out. So don't fret. You don't have to remember all of this right now. Read the manual. It's really important in this case to do properly. Next, please, Mike. I can't tell you enough. Atlasing in the far north is an exhausting experience, but it's it's been the highlight of every year of the atlas that I've been able to travel up there. I think you really will love it. All right, we're going to move on. One more mic, please. Just a, a thanks to everyone involved, including the four or the five main partners. 
and and all of the other groups and a special shout out to Kaylin and Mike who've done such a great job getting all of this organized and all the other people behind the scenes who are doing that work as well. Next Mike please. All right, don't forget you can see this on social media on Facebook on Instagram on Twitter and I'm going to pass everything over to Natasha at this point. Natasha, are you still around? I am. Can you hear me? Yep, all good. Okay, perfect, perfect. That was great. That let me be really excited, and I am pumped to do some of this this year. Um, I hope everyone's feeling that excitement too, especially by seeing those photos. Even though I know all of us won't be able to go to the north, we can still try to find some beautiful nature here. So I know we're a little over time, which is totally fine. A lot of great resources. Um, if you want to go take a break, if, but we're um, feel free to do that. But we're going to answer some questions. And then at five o'clock, and I'll remind everyone again, but there will be a submitting data session starting around five. So I kind of tried to group these questions together. Everyone is very excited and very keen, which is great. Um, I'll just say that I have answered a few questions already. If people are interested in that, so feel free to check those out. But um, what happens when a freelancer is doing point counts in a square where the primary atlaser is also doing a point count? Is there station duplication? Yeah, there certainly would be if that were the case. Uh, we would like to try and avoid that as much as we can. So we ask if, you're, if you are a freelancer to contact the regional coordinator and, and check as to whether the, uh, uh, the, the uh, principal atlaser will be doing point counts in there. Um, I'll say that there were questions about the manual, when it'll be available, it'll be soon, it'll be under the instructions tab on the website, so just stay tuned for that. Um, and also questions about the four letter codes, it, that'll also be coming soon under the tools and resources tab, so check that out. Um, another question of how long after sunrise and for what duration should we do our early morning point counts? I'm assuming that will also be in the manual. Yeah, but uh, it should have been in my slideshow. I just realized with all this shuffling around. Um, yeah, it's half an hour before sunrise until five hours after sunrise. Perfect. We, we do recommend like, get when it starts getting towards um, nine or 10 o'clock, things are starting to get quieter. So usually um, it's good to spread them out over those first few hours of the early morning, but um, especially later towards the end of June and into early July, um, it's getting pretty quiet in, in, the, in that late morning. You probably want to do fewer points at that time. And I'm biased, but I'm not a morning person, but point counts are definitely the best. So they are well <laughs> worth it to get up early. In the um, two questions kind of related. Are point counts done only once in five years? If yes, is it better to do it in the last year of the atlas? So yes, they are only done once. And uh, no, it doesn't really matter what year you do them. Perfect. Um, someone on that note too, is it okay to tackle the point counts over several years, some each year? Same question for OWL surveys. Yeah, you can, you can certainly spread them out. I, I did a lot last Atlas of doing all, we had uh, 25 points we were trying to do. I could do, um, I could do that many on the road in the morning if I started early enough and, and didn't do anything else. Um, that's sort of the extreme. We don't need to do that. You can mix them into your atlasing as you move around the square, do a few one day, a few another day, um, spread them out over the years. It, it's, um, it, it's up to you. I, I, do, I, I do suspect in more developed areas, they're gonna get done pretty early, um, but um, Certainly, we're going to need the help up in central Ontario, basically from Muskoka on north. Um, we're going to need a lot of people helping out doing points up there. So would encourage people to be thinking about that. Just a quick comment. Same for marsh birds. You can do the point counts in different years in a particular square. But if you're going to do the two visits at one of the stations, those two visits need to be in the same year. But it doesn't matter which year. OK, great. And picking up on something you said, Mike, um, Someone asked, does the time spent doing point counts count towards 20 hours coverage in a square? Yeah, it does. Perfect. I'm scrolling back up. I'm not ignoring you. I'm looking at my questions over here. Um, 
how would someone record birds that they see that aren't singing if they're doing the digital point count? They, they don't. And uh, that, that's one of the differences between the two. And it, it's, um, it's something that we have to work out. We actually are going to, um, things are going to develop a little bit over time with the way we do these. We're, we're going to ask a certain number of people who are doing full point counts uh, by ear to also record them so that we get an, an idea of how frequently that happens and the extent to which that happens. And we're going to be um, rating other data sources to, uh, to um, get us basically correction factors as to how, um, which species are likely to be showing up um, on visual point counts that aren't showing up on the recordings. I love data. And, and maybe I, I should say, we decided not to do it this year but we're quite possibly going to introduce the idea of having the person that's doing a, a, a digital recording actually record the, identify the birds that they can see. But it, it, at this point, we're saying anybody can do the visual, the, the digital point count. But if we're gonna introduce this other thing, then we're gonna to have to make sure that people can identify the birds that they're seeing that are flying around. So we, we didn't wanna jump right into that this first year. We probably will be bringing that in in later years. Perfect, perfect. Okay, a few questions are around the kind of digital output. Um, what kind of digital output do you want? What kind of recorder do you need? And also on top of that, do you want photos? Okay, oh, boy. Um, the digital recordings, um, we really want you to use the Zoom H2N. Um, if you have something equivalent or very similar to it, and again, on the website, there will be information as to which other um, devices are equivalent, um, then yeah, it's okay to use those. Um, and that'll be, that'll be described. Now I forget what the rest of the question was. Um, do you want photos? Oh, uh, no, we, we, we're not doing that just because um, we don't have an easy way of dealing with it all. I, I should say that in the in the north, in in the remote north, the kind of places Mark was talking about, um, we are we are actually developing a standard protocol for a, a system for connect for collecting photos around each station. Um, but we're not doing that in the south just because it's a lot to ask the volunteers. We're we're asking the volunteers a lot already. Um, if somebody wanted to. Can, well, the question is, can we send our point count recording to our own reliable source to determine the species list if they're good at bioacoustic projects in the area that have offered to do this? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, I hadn't, hadn't thought about that one. Um, I don't know. Let's stay tuned on that one. Uh, the hope would be that people would go in and use this wild track system. It, it's, a, it's a really nice system that they've got. Um, for, I, um, for managing the files and for actually going through and identifying visually on the sonogram which song is which as you're going through. Um, and, and it's a really wonderful way of quantifying and um, we're, we're intending to get those up on, the, on a website, some examples of those, so people can actually learn from these recordings, um, you know, more about bird identification. So uh, we certainly encourage uh, everybody to use that, that wild track system. That's really what's gonna be in place. You're still on mute, Natasha. <laughs> what do you think I was saying? Take a guess. <laughs> um, should we distinguish between birds that are singing versus like call notes, flyovers, for example? No, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. For it, really the point counts all about counting how many birds there are. Um, either in those time bands or it, it, if you're interested in doing it in the distance bands as well. Moving on to time bands, great segue, unplanned. So because of the three plus two minute interval, um, it would be useful to on the app to have a five minute timer included, which maybe you can't answer, but just a thought. Yeah, yeah, the hope is to do that. It, it's sort of high on the priority list, but there's a, a lot of things that are high on the priority list. So. It, it may not happen by the time by this year, um, if and I kind of doubt it will, given all the other things we're we're trying to get done. But it I, it almost certainly will be done um, by next year. If anyone wants to volunteer, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, are we recording the um, like time band separately? Like, do we do the first three minutes and then take time 
and then do the second two minutes? Or is it just a consistent five minute? No, it's just a, it's just a solid five minutes. There's no gap between the two. Perfect. Um, a, someone said a field nearby is a breeding spot for bobolink. Nice work. Lots of males singing and females flying. How do I point count this? You just do the best you can. Um, you just uh, um, count as count as well as you can. And if you can't count, you have to estimate. You estimate. Um, yeah. There is always the possibility if, if you can say here's something you can't identify, you can mark that as an unidentified bird, go back later and, and uh, work out the identity. I'd hesitate to say that with a field full of bobblings. I mean, you could, you could possibly, as long as you're not going to bias your results, you could you know, come up with an estimate and then go over later and count them and say, okay, they really were 13. Um, but as, only as long as your estimate was roughly 13. Um, to start with, you know, if you couldn't if you couldn't see over the brow of the hill, you can only report the ones that you can actually uh, see or or hear. Perfect. Um, I'm going to jump to marsh bird surveys for a second. So, what birds are you broadcasting? Yeah. So the the broadcast species there's six of them. So it's least bittern, Sora, Virginia rail, um, and then there's a the there's um common gallinule and american coot mixed together and then pie billed grebe those are those are the broadcast species for the marsh bird survey okay. and then a question on atlasing um what do you have timing for the northless at timing for northern atlasing trips in mind specifically would they be in may or early june or could this happy happy happen in late june early july for those of us who are teachers in our other yeah, northern atlasing is probably best in, in June and, and early July. Um, June's probably the ideal time, but the farther north you go, uh, the more you can delay. So yeah, if, if you can do it, or if you're interested, contact the office for more information and, and they'll start rec recording these ideas. Perfect. All right. I know there's a lot of questions that I didn't get to. Um, we're just going to wrap up. Some of the questions I think will be potentially answered in the next session at five about submitting data. And then I think some of them I'm just reading through will a lot of it will be answered once the manuals come out. So just stay tuned, check all those instructions. And I think those questions will be answered there. But regardless, point counting is great. I wish I could get up to the north and I'm excited to check out some marsh birds. So thank you for everyone for coming. Um, thanks, Natasha. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks everyone. Great presentation. Good luck at listening. It'll be fine. You'll all do great.